us a little bit about your growing up. Where did you come from? Uh, well, my parents, well, I came out of the womb of my mother. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, and, and as ever, I was ever pushy because uh, my parents actually came from Scotland. My father diverse because my father worked for Shell Oil, and so my eldest brother, who was 15 years older than me, who was born in, in uh, Los Angeles. Um, but they came back to Britain eventually in, in the Depression. And then uh, I came down to, from Scotland to Coventry because my father was offered a job. And uh, my mother was pregnant with me, so I arrived four months, three months early. Um, and it was in 1936, the year that Hitler invaded the, the uh, Ruhr um, and took over the Rhineland, and Edward the Eighth, the Duke of Windsor, abdicated. And wow. So quite eventful, really. Uh, but he didn't get the job, so he went back to Scotland. And then a couple of years later, he came back to uh, 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 be works manager at a factory in Coventry. And uh, we were there till uh, I started went to national service. And at my school, uh, I wasn't very clever at school, I'm afraid. Uh, didn't pass any exam. So rather uh, possibly made up for it later, but uh, not at school. Well, you were you were a little boy during World War II. Tell us a little bit about that time for you. Uh, well, of course, the the actual time, of course, obviously uh, in 1939 the Second World War started, and um, we like, living in Coventry in 1940. Coventry in November was one of the first cities in Britain apart from London to be heavily bombed and something like about 800 people died, wow. unfortunately, and there were many casualties. I, I don't remember much about it. My, my parents, looking back, my parents were very, very kindly sort of well, sheltered me, I suppose, but I do remember uh, in after when I was about four, the bombing raid, there was no water or electricity. Wow. And the uh, police and emergency services um, came to see my mother, and we had a, a coal range in the kitchen. And she was able to boil water, and people queued up through the house. I remember people doing that. And, uh, but really, I was rather protected. I, I, I don't remember being affected by the war, although I suppose all women, because it was very much sort of women were house, where they looked after the house in those days, um, I suppose that they must have had enormous problems feeding them, because of course of the rationing and that sort of thing. Absolutely, I should think so. But you began work at an early age uh, as a retailer selling books in a stationery shop, magazines. You even worked in a lending library. Tell us about your early days in your professional world. Uh, well, I, I, as, I, as I said, I didn't have any qualifications when I left school at 16. And um, so much against my father's will, uh, I went to work for a firm, this is the publicity plan, uh, w. H. Smith, and I worked for the man and boy for 36 years. But uh, we had started delivering newspapers and then gradually uh, moved to the other departments in the shop, in the store in Coventry. And there was a slight incident which I'm almost sure no one here will remember um, because they were actually closed about 1955 or 56. But uh, both Smiths and Boots had lending libraries, and um, people could pay a yearly subscription, and the really superior people paid six guineas, uh, six pounds, six shillings, it was then, and they could choose any book they liked, and, and uh, obviously <clears throat> they had a preference for the new, the latest title. And then there was the A paid three pounds, and then the muckers who paid <laughs> one pound fifty. B, we were called B tickets. 
Um, and the theory was that people would walk, the libraries were always at the back of the store. And the theory was that people would walk through and they would see a book or a stationery or newspapers or whatever that they liked. And they would buy it. Well, it, in fact, it was rubbish. People just walked in, chose the book, and went back out again. <laughs> Um, by about the mid 50s, it's realised that they weren't really attracting customers, so they produced the space much more profitably. Um, but my father uh, went to see the manager and said, Is there anything that my son can study? And uh, the upshot was that I did books of his exams, which was literature and trade practice. Um, which actually the university standard eventually. Um, and so I passed. And, um, but I started in Smith's glorious sun, working Mondays to Saturdays, sometimes Sunday, Thursday afternoon off, and I got paid one pound twenty-five pence <laughs> cash. Wow. <laughs> How did you survive? <laughs> well, I didn't. My, fa my father insisted I gave the mother a pound on Friday, and by Tuesday she would slip me five shillings. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have any, but it, it, it actually had a, a benefit in that when I did my national service, virtually all the boys in Billet smoked. I never earned enough money to buy cigarettes, <laughs> so I didn't really smoke. So it wasn't a problem, and in the, especially in the early days of the National Service, you would go up on a Thursday, <clears throat> stand in front of the officer and salute and stamp your feet and say your number, 272 6701, and sir, and, uh, and he would give you whatever money it was. But of course, a lot of the guys, they bought the best cigarettes on Thursday and Friday, mm. and then it gradually descended, and I don't know if anyone here remembers, but there used to be cigarettes called Woodbine, <laughs> and they were actually sold, in, they sold them in 20, 10, and 5 in a packet, <laughs> and some of the guys by Tuesday were managing to get 5 packets behind oh, them. Oh, oh, oh. So, uh, you know, that was, uh, it was an advantage that uh, I didn't actually earn very much money. I actually went up, I think when I was 17, I went up to 30 shillings a week, £1.50. But I actually was worse off because I had to pay national insurance then when you were 17. So I actually got less money than I did when I was 60. <laughs> wow. 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 <clears throat> Please give us some perspective. What, what would that equate roughly today? in today's currency. What would you afford with that money? I haven't really any idea of how much it equates. I'm sure there's probably someone here today that would be able to say, but um, I, I mean, when, I, when, when you did your national service, um, the last six months of the two years, you actually got regulars pay. And I was getting, I was a senior air craftsman acting corporal. And uh, people had to sometimes call me sir. Wow. <laughs> and uh, they, they, um, we used to, and I got six pounds a week and my key. And I went back to Smith's for about five pounds, ten shillings a week, and I had to give my mother four pounds because my father said, You must give your mother money. Uh, but, but it did, I, I have to say that um, the company promoted me and I, I was able to uh, advance. I, I've got to actually give them credit. And they were great, I, uh, the, the, I, I have comments now about them, um, but I have to be very careful because I get a pension from them. Uh, and I don't want to upset anybody. But in those days, the Smith family were very dominant and um, you know, the, the Honourable David Smith would come visit and, and that lady Helen Schmidt and so forth. And it, 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 I know paternalism is often criticised nowadays, but a lot of us worked for the company for not very large wages because we enjoyed the atmosphere, we enjoyed working with the company, they had uh, a, a, a 
very good welfare system. They had a convalescent home in one hill. Well, um, and, and I know that it's called paternalism, but a slight hobby horse of mine is I hate the initials HR. It's not human relations, it's people. And I, mm -hmm. I think that today people should be referred to, I think, HR departments. Uh, it's totally wrong. And it's, and it's good. That's a hobby horse of mine, so there you are. Wow, okay. But your job took you to Belgium. Yeah. So tell us about going to Belgium and what happened to you there. Uh, well, I went to, uh, by this time I was working in Birmingham and um, I had my books on this exam. And in those days, uh, W. H. Smith had a store in uh, Paris and in Brussels and Amsterdam. Uh, before the Second World War, there was one in Berlin, but um, Mr. Hitler didn't like that. Uh, so that closed. Anyway, the, the gentleman who was in, it was thought that only British people could actually buy books in English. So the book buyer in Belgium and France was always British uh, in those days. And um, the book buyer, his wife had a baby and the baby unfortunately died. And she blamed, she, she believed that if she'd been in Britain, the baby would have lived. And so as a welfare thing, the company brought them back and they sent somebody. We had a customer called Countess Nippon, who was the first woman to buy, fly solo to the Belgian Congo and back. You know that she was rather a determined lady. She'd been a refugee or a Belgian refugee with the Smith family in the First World War, and um, she rang up the chairman, uh, the Honourable David Smith, and said she didn't think this gentleman was really very good. So he was brought back to oblivion, and I was asked to go for three weeks while they looked for someone better. It was in October. <laughs> <laughs> and it was in October, and then I, I was asked to stay till Christmas. Okay. And then in January I was after. Well, the first week uh, I went to something in the Grand Place and it was very crowded. And um, <clears throat> I felt a gentleman um, leaning up against the front of me. I was standing there and he was pressing to my back or to my front. So um, anyway, we had a coffee a little later, and uh, we ended up being together 19 years. Oh, uh, so, uh, because at the time, I, I should say that I wasn't really quite sure of my sexuality. Uh, I liked women, but I wasn't sure I actually wanted to go to bed with them. Uh, and indeed, in, Bel in Britain, I had a girlfriend, uh, Janet, uh, she went on to marry somebody else and she had seven children. Uh, but um, anyway, Alexander and I got together. He was about seven years older than me. Uh, and looking back on it, he, he was very clever because uh, he was very into being fisted. Okay. And uh, me, I didn't know fisting even existed. <laughs> In fact, we, 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 we biked up to Amsterdam at one time, one weekend. And because we both worked shifts uh, in our respective jobs, it was difficult to actually get the weekend together. But we went up to Amsterdam, and we went to some, uh, I think it was called the Anko. And in those days, it was a, really was a clean pit. <laughs> And uh, anyway, we, we, we went through our things and the, 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 the rooms were about five people to, a, you know, five beds. And I don't think there was much furniture where you could put anything. Um, but we, anyway, we went out to, on, to have a, a night out in Amsterdam, our big night out. We came back and there was this guy at the top of the stairs sobbing his heart out. And I went up to him and I said, oh dear. What's wrong? And I felt it, you know, so I said, you're all wet. Oh, I said, you must get out of those clothes. You'll catch your death of cold. 
Well, of course, he'd been in some shower or piss scene. <laughs> <laughs> and Alexander was leaning against the wall, hysterical with laughter, because I didn't know that people did that stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 uh, but, but he was very, very good because he led me, led me gently into, um, if you like, the leather and fetish scene, and uh, with love. And it wasn't a turn off. Uh, and so, therefore, um, you know, I thank his memory and, and say, you know, say thank you for the privilege of having known him and being with him so long. Let's take a step back a little bit, something that was glossed over a moment ago. During your time in the National Service, you experienced the early days of gay London. Tell us a bit about that. Ah, well, um, of course, we didn't get much money in natural service. And um, so sometimes you would get a pass. I was actually stationed near Dover. And um, in those days, Dover was what was called a garrison town. And it was large, uh, there were two army camps, there was the Navy, and there was the Royal Air Force. The Royal Air Force in those days, we had underground, I don't know if we still have, in those days we had underground radar stations all around the coast and the camp I was on. I was a cook in the Royal Air Force, but only for officers. And, and, uh, and so uh, on the Friday, uh, the trains to London, say Friday afternoon, you get a 48 hour pass. And on Friday afternoon, the trains to London would be packed with Navy, Army, and Air Force between the ages of 18 and 20. Mm -hmm. Because you could go to London and you could stay at the Union Jack Club, which still exists, I understand. The Union Jack Club for 10 shillings a night, including breakfast. Wow. And then you would perhaps, uh, the weather was quite nice. Um, you could go to Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park. Uh, usually, there were a number of gentlemen. Um, of course, you'd be in uniform. That was part of the attraction for some gentlemen. And sometimes, very nice gentlemen would um, uh, uh, speak to you, and uh, he would say hello. And uh, then they might say, would you like to have a coffee? And then they might take you to dinner. And then they might say, would you like to stay the night? Uh -huh. uh, but there were also several pubs. Uh, I, I don't remember them all now, but there were certain pubs. That, for example, there was one near Knightsbridge Barrett, which was, that was where the army went, you know, and a lot of the guards, soldiers went. Uh, and of course, if you didn't find anything, I'm afraid some people used to get arrested in Hyde Park during the night for doing something they shouldn't do. Because of course, it was all illegal in those days, consenting sex between the same members of the, of, uh, of the same sex. Illegal, totally illegal. Coming back to your, your Belgian days and to Alexander. You two spent a lot of time in Amsterdam. Please tell us about the gay scene you experienced in Amsterdam at that time. Uh, well, I, I've got to be very honest, we didn't, because of the work we, jumped, we both did, Alexander was actually in the police force, mm -hmm. and how we solved it was we found a, a, a block of flats that was being constructed in the Basilica in Brussels and uh, had a flat on each floor. And so Alexander took one flat from out of and one above. So I can't say we went often to Amsterdam, to Amsterdam but of course it was, it, it, it at the time was much more evolved, had evolved much more as an overall game scene, not necessarily leather and fetish. Um, and um, I can be corrected, but there was quite a strong 
gay association, the name of which uh, I escaped at the moment. I think it was called something like COC. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. But um, they they were actually they organised events sometimes, and, uh, and and so it was. And I suppose to some extent the the civilization of the Netherlands and the uh, how the people, the Dutch people evolved, they were perhaps leading in that they were much more tolerant, uh, provided it wasn't excessive, mm -hmm. they were much more tolerant than in other places. When I when I went to Belgium, um, it was extremely Catholic and uh, uh, the, we weren't allowed to sell magazines like Penthouse or Playboy. Uh, that was, I mean, uh, uh, when, it, when they were banned, my boss said, oh, um, you know, if you and I get a subscription to it from New York, we, uh, then I can give it to my friends. And we actually had a visit from the police. My gosh. Uh, and um, one time, I don't know what it was that we were selling, and we got a phone call from uh, an MPP, the wholesaler, saying, the police are here, they raided us. And we sort of went to wherever the section was and took all the stuff off and uh, pretended we were rearranging the fixtures. So when the police came, uh, sort of my boss said well, afterwards, where did you put it? And I said, they're in the drawers in your office. <laughs> <laughs> seen an extraordinary evolution of the gay scene, and the kink scene, and BDSM scenes. Please tell us how you've seen those evolve over the years. I, I think that, um, I mean, obviously, uh, to a certain extent, about the leather scene is concerned, the, the big thing was, I mean, many of the original, uh, if you like, leather clubs, were originally bike clubs mm. because it was a way of wearing leather uh, which wouldn't attract untoward criticism or remarks. I'm, I'm not saying, um, and I mean, even in the 80s, there were people who, uh, members of the, of the then Manchester Super Chain, who were unhappy about actually walking in the streets of Manchester in leather. So they would sometimes bring a bag or something with uh, some of their leather items. Um, I think it's just a question that slowly, uh, certainly large parts of the Western world, Europe and the United States, we've got to remember that so much of the world is, is whether if they're behind or whether they're wrong or right, I'm not going to go into, but uh, there were so many countries that, where people do have enormous problems, and I expect Joe will refer to that. But um, slowly it has sort of evolved that people, you know, the, the people that were, the, the, for example, the, the evolution of, of Pride Weekends. I remember when the first one or two started in Manchester, and it was a trestle table in Canal Street, more or less. Wow. Uh, but it, 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 you know, it's, but things like Pride did begin to uh, broaden people, so people sort of said, oh, but of course, uh, for us in Britain, in the United Kingdom, uh, 1967 and the legalization of consenting sex that meant sort of actually brought it out into the open. Oh. That there were men who liked men. Um, and I, I think I think that was a real kind of breakthrough when that happened. But it took a long time. I mean the, the Wolfenden report which recommended that was ten years earlier. So these things are probably to take time, I'm afraid. It's a question of uh, if you live long enough. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts about the contemporary gay, lesbian, BDSM, king scenes? Oh, I, I mean, now, uh, it, I, I would have said that, 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 that 
again, we have the, the, the prefix of certain countries and certain, I mean, of a, you know that there are parts of the United States where gay people have a lot of problems. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's a great thing for me. Um, it took me quite a long time to actually come out. And it, in a sense, that was an accident because the, the then Manchester Super Chain hosted uh, an ECMC, European Grouping, uh, meeting in 1997. And um, I wasn't in, wasn't on a committee or anything like that, but I helped rel welcome the railway station. <coughs> and unbeknownst to me, I was being filmed by BBC. And um, it appeared on television, and I went home and there were some messages, and uh, one of them was from a friend of mine, Paul Muriel, and she said, just seen you on the television, oh! <laughs> and I was in long leather in a cap. <laughs> but, uh, and if how the situation has evolved, I'm a, I'm a, I was the token gay member of Rotary. Oh. We actually have a gay president. Wow. Um, in, in uh, where I live. But we had a member who was a senior police officer in Man Greater Manchester. And I, to be quite honest, I thought it was a right wing homophobic bastard. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but when this happened, he, we had, I went to the meeting and he came up to me and he said, he and I saw the television. And I thought, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> And he said, just let me know if there's any, if you have any problems, let me know. And I was astounded that, you know, person, I, I had summed him up as really being homophobic. Yes. And, and I thought, well, it, the world is evolving. And uh, therefore, you know, it will be, uh, things will get, will get better. The, it, it's by no means over. Um, there are still people, many, many people, who um, unfortunately cannot come to terms. Uh, everybody has the right to view, to their own view, but it has to be expressed in a civilised way. A moment ago you mentioned the Manchester Super Chain Motorsports Club. Please tell us a bit about that. And um, that started about 1983. Uh, there was a group uh, met in a pub yeah, in Deansgate and, um, and sort of evolved. And it was a very, very uh, uh, flourishing at the time by, by sort of 1990. There's a, a bar nearby here called the Pomium, which we were able to use the summer. Uh, and it was rather. Uh, discreet lighting. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, I mean, someone could actually touch you. <laughs> um, but we know you did. I was a bit better. <laughs> I was a bit better looking in those days. <laughs> Ravages of uh, time happened. Uh, and it, but anyway, it was it, 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 it was very good. Unfortunately, in the late nineties. There were some problems, and uh, so we had a rocky time. And then, uh, in uh, about four years ago, uh, the, the then president died very suddenly. And I was asked if I would be president. Unfortunately, a lot of the records and archives were lost in this, you know, in, from about 2000 to 2000. And oh. so I said, yes, I would become president, but we had to do two things. We had to either expand or close. And then I knew Saxon uh, a little bit, and we got together and we chatted, and we felt that we could, uh, I mean, the, the, the full name of Manchester Super Chain was Manchester Super Chain Motor Sports Club, which you know, on all sorts of documents and things, it's, it's a, well, never mind Facebook, uh, or Twitter, or Instagram, um, it, it's a mouthful. So we came up with the idea of Manchester Leathermen. Uh -huh. And um, 
and and we we had fallen behind the times in that we weren't on Facebook, we weren't on Twitter, we weren't. So we needed to modernise, which is what quite a lot of clubs do need to take a grip of uh, and and be aware of how people communicate today. Been a big learning curve for another daddy, I can tell you. <laughs> what, what future did you see for Manchester? Uh, well, oh, uh, is that tempting fate? <laughs> um, I would like to think that, um, I, I mean, the biggest thing that I've got to say about Manchester for a minute is that. I think without exception, every member that I have met has qualities that I can admire. And I would like to think that, uh, I mean, Manchester Leathermen has members not just in Manchester or the Northwest, but um, uh, in all parts of the country, and indeed on several poles. And I would like to think that. Uh, we may have to recognise the dangers of perhaps being too big, uh, but I, I, I hope that we would continue to have members who enjoyed being together, who were friendly, who realised that we all have problems. We all have, we all have something which at the bottom of our heart we perhaps don't want to talk about or, or, or we, could, we conceal. I mean, one of the things that we, that wonderful things that happened is it's a group called Roland the Ball, uh, as part of Manchester which is help, hope tries to help people who, who have, feel the pressure of modern day life. Mm. Uh, and then there is, of course, uh, bookies, which, um, enables very new, hopefully new people who think, well now, you know, what is this leather thing? What, what, what is this all about? So, and I, so I, I would like, I, I do hope that uh, we continue to flourish. Um, so many clubs have come and gone, Absolutely. but uh, I hope they will go on because there's so many great people who are members. I mean, the same can be said about clubs in, um, in, in the States, in Europe, uh, you know, the, I mean, I have visited quite a few places, and the world is lovely, uh, and um, sometimes you can even have sex as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, as, as a gentleman of a, of a tender age, how do you see aging? in the leather and keep community? Uh, well, I think the ageing in leather and, and fetish and keep community really depends on the individual. Um, a lot of people who get older, uh, such as, as my age, or even getting at my age, um, they sort of retreat. Mm. And um, there is no reason why you can't, you don't have to go out every night or every week, but you can maintain a link. Um, and, um, and, and so, therefore, I think as it is, there is a bit of a, a little bit of a thing that the gay world as a whole is something that sort of ends when you're 35 or 40. <laughs> yeah, we see that. Um, but, you know, it doesn't. And uh, I, I, I think it does depend on, on the individual concerned. Mm. Okay. You have been part of this community long enough to have seen AIDS come and go and the devastation that that created and then whatever followed it. Tell us a little bit about how you saw that unfold in the community. Uh, well, in, in, I, until about 10 years ago, I used to bike quite a lot. And um, it was part of my work. I came back after having some, I worked in Belgium and France for about 19 years. 
and Alexander was killed in a car crash. And for various reasons, I had to decide, I mean, the longest time I spent was my time in Belgium, and this is the coded reference, my time in Belgium was seven super years. And I had my arm twisted to go to France, not because I wanted to go to France, but because the boss in France that I was going to be deputed to had a rather involved private life, which included three lady friends and his wife. <laughs> um, plus, the business didn't make any money, so career-wise, it was a bit difficult. Anyway, I, I eventually became the patron, and, uh, and, but then after Alexander died, for various reasons, uh, I came back to Britain, and I was manager of a store in London for a couple of years, and then I was asked to go to Cambridge, not because the would be known by grey, of course, <laughs> but um, the business where it was the zone at the time, it was 400 years of selling books on that site. Oh. Not the same people, but... <laughs> and so I was, I was uh, asked to, to go and uh, give them a little bit of money uh, to promote this uh, thing. So I invited the Duke of Edinburgh, and uh, there's a photograph somewhere of he and I together. <clears throat> but we didn't go in the dark room. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, but there was, in those days, there was a group called East Anglia Bikers. And we had a, a, a party or a weekend or something. And there were these two guys there from London. And um, a few weeks later, I was in London. This was about 1981. I was in London and I bumped into one of them. And I said, oh, hello, how are you? How is whatever the guy's name was, his partner? Hmm. And he said, he's dead. And I, I couldn't believe it. And I said, pardon? And he was the first person that I had heard about uh, had died of AIDS, because of course, it was so rapid then, there was no, there was no way. Um, and then, and, it, and I think from the point of view of the gay world, gay and fetish world, AIDS was a tra not only a tragedy for the people that died and the people that cared for them and loved them, but it was a tragedy because it was a setback. And there were a lot of people who felt that you know, it was judgment upon gay people, yeah. or, yeah. Um, or uh, and, it, and, and it was a bit of a setback. And, and I know that, uh, not that I'm a great royal uh, admirer, but I mean, in I think it was about 88 or 89, Princess Diana went to one of the London hospitals, yeah. and people, people were amazed. She actually touched somebody who had AIDS. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I remember when I was a child, you would go to, when I worked in Smith's, um, we only had a lady's toilet. And the gentleman, the, the manager and I, who were the only male star, we were given sixpence a week to go down to the toilets in Grey Fires Green. Wow. And in case we had to spend pennies, in some case, of course. And, uh, and on the toilets in those days, there used to be this enormous sign, Beware of Syphilis. Oh. And it would, people thought you could catch syphilis by, uh, you know, sitting on the toilet or something. Yeah. Well, people were like that, with AIDS, that, that, you know. And, and, but the tragedy was, two, two ways. One was, people um, were disowned by their families, and the other one was, that, I mean, undertakers were refusing to actually, you know, bury or only do it in, in certain, literally put them in people in a body bag. Yeah. Um, and I used to, I visited, about by 83 or so, I was in Manchester, and I heard about, uh, well, one of the Manchester Super Chain members, and, um, he lived in Rochdale, and I heard that he was in the hospice in Rochdale. 
And I went to see him. And he was, at the time, he was very ill, but he was, you know, fully, fully competent. And I, the nurse said, I was the first person to visit him oh. in the seven weeks that he had been there at the time. Oh. And his family didn't want to know. And uh, I went back, and the, the second time he knew me, and then the third time, um, he was unconscious. Well, he certainly wasn't conscious. And I just stood there and held his hand and said a prayer. But it really seared my, you know, the fact that he had been disowned. Yeah. No, uh, uh, and a group, a group, two or three of us, um, actually arranged a funeral because no one, there was, no one else wanted to know. So it was a very traumatic time, and and a lot of people who were in their budding early careers uh, were, were cut short. Um, and I know that some people have said, "Oh, well, they were promiscuous and they were asking for it." Um, but that's not really the question. That's not really the issue. Yes. But as, a, as a, an aside, um, a, a friend of mine who died, well, a much older friend of mine, who died uh, about six months ago, um, he, uh, he was actually a pathologist in Greater Manchester. And he claimed, I mean, I have no idea whether it's true or not, but he claimed that he had done... Uh, Thing on this, a man in 1957 who had, who had the symptoms of AIDS. Uh -huh. and, uh, you know, whether we, I, I have no idea, I mean, he, you know, in the sense it's hearsay. And the poor gentleman did now, anyway. But uh, there we are. But no, it was very traumatic. Uh, but it, it's wonderful that, uh, uh, in a sense, in a lot of people in the United States, in Europe, in Britain, uh, by, by the later 80s, we began to say, we need to do something. Yeah. Something has to be done. There must, and hopefully there will be a cure. Uh, well, I hope there will be a cure before I die. We can hope. Well, well unfortunately, <laughs> I, I, I didn't succumb to AIDS, but uh, I, I hope that I will live to see you, see you. One issue that we all face in the community is the inclusion of new people coming into the scene. What advice have you for a new person entering the leather scene? I think the inclusion of new people very much depends upon uh, the other people that are around them. Um, one of the things which I, I personally think, now I'm sure there's a lot of people to say it's rubbish, but I really am actually quite a shy retiring person. We know that. <laughs> we do. Um, but I, 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 I don't, I mean, I, I know some people don't want to be pressed. You know, there's a kind of balance, isn't there? But it, it, it does grieve me in many ways if someone has sort of perhaps come to, to an event. It would never be a leather or fetish it could be anything. Yeah. Um, and, and they're sort of standing there. And the other one, the other danger, of course, is in all kinds of groups, no matter whether they're gay or not, uh, you can sometimes get little gangs, little yes, yes. and they don't understand, uh, you know. And uh, uh, the number of times I've, over the years, where I've heard someone say, well, I went, but nobody spoke to me. And, uh, you know, I went and I left. Yeah. Uh, no one said, how are you, or good morning, or whatever. So I, I think it does depend. I mean, because some people are, this, you know, most of us are quite reserved. Uh, so I mean, you're not wanting someone to envelop, you know, and have them 
there is there is that other end, isn't there, where where you, you think somebody is so organising that you think, oh God, I wish they'd piss off. <laughs> <laughs> What's the biggest misconception about you? That I'm shy. <laughs> <laughs> Two claims to fame. Okay. One is I was kissed by General de Gaulle. Oh, so I, there were about 10,000 other people standing there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other one is I carried Margaret Thatcher's handbag. Oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Didn't and, match your boots. <laughs> uh, no, it, it was because uh, when she ended being Prime Minister, she wrote uh, two volumes of memoirs, but the first one was called Her Downing Street Year. And um, I opened Waterstones in Manchester, um, we also was a bookshop called Shows and Use, which we know. And so we had her to sign, I know in the evening we had a dinner, and then she signed more. And um, so that was how I carried her handbag. But in actual fact, we had quite a lot of signing sessions with various authors and people and so forth. And I used to get quite worried every time. I used to get worried before. I mean, one of the greatest things of this weekend for me is that Tony is the boss. <laughs> and, and last year, I was very nervous about, you know, I was president. I was nervous, uh, and, I, 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 and I have to take a deep breath. And the, the, the signing session, before they actually started, you know, the thought of actually dealing with, with large members of the public and a particular author, I would really have to take a deep breath and, and, and think, well, the only thing to do is to go forth. And, uh, and, and do something, uh, but I, I, I do get uh, or have got concerned, you know, before. But, uh, but I do. I, th I think the reverse is to try and be outgoing. Oh. Thank you for an amazing chat. Well, thank you for inviting me. <laughs>